Hello and welcome to our full course lecture which is Introduction to Accounting. Don't forget you can download all of our mind maps shown here for free on our website www.mapitaccountancy.com. So this is starting at the very start, the very basics of accounting. We're going to look here at the different types of business entity that a person could set up. We're going to look in a bit more detail then at limited companies, which generally speaking will be um, those companies that trade for shareholders. Then we'll look at some accounting, how we account within those limited companies, and then we'll think about the regulation that regulates them. So starting at the very start with our different types of business entity. So let's pretend that we've come up with a fantastic idea for a business. We want to start trading as quickly as possible. Well, what are our choices? How can we go about trading? Well, the first thing we could do is set ourselves up as a sole trader. And that means literally just go and open a bank account in a trading name. But the key aspect here is that we will be owning that business ourselves. So it's going to be owned by us. We will manage it. So we're not bringing anyone else in. We don't have any partners. We don't have uh, any shareholders. We simply own the business. We manage it. We take full responsibility. Now, you might have employees, but those employees will only have responsibility to you for the job that they're doing. They won't have liability in law if, for example, that business was making losses and you couldn't pay them back. And that's the key thing here. Any losses that are made by this business, if it is a sole trader, will be borne by the owner themselves, no one else. So if you set up as a sole trader, you take full responsibility, you manage the business yourself. You might have some employees, but you are the one taking responsibility. If that business takes losses, well then you have to make them good yourself. And you will be legally obliged to make those losses good. So for example, if you couldn't cover the losses, uh, creditors may pursue you personally and could perhaps take your assets like your home, your car, those sorts of things. So what are the pros and cons then of setting up as a sole trader? Well, on the plus side, it's very simple. You can simply just go and open a bank account in that trading name and start trading. It's also very flexible. So you can do a multitude of different things. You don't have to an answer to anybody as you are the full sole owner. You're managing the business yourself. So you won't have to answer to shareholders, for example, questioning what you do. It's also manageable. There's less a uh, regulation, for example, so less things that you have to do. Now, on the downside, well, the key downside on this is that unlimited liability. Remember I said that if you make losses as a sole trader, you personally are responsible for them. You will have to make good those losses, even if it means you selling your own assets. So unlimited liability is one of the aspects you need to be aware of here. So you're going to have to take that personal risk. You also then have to rely on that owner. So you have to rely on yourself. You make the decisions. You are the owner. You're taking all the risk and you need to be aware of that as a sole trader. So that's the first thing you could do. You could set the business up as a sole trader, taking full responsibility and knowing that the risk is all yours. Or perhaps you could go for a partnership. Now, a partnership is quite similar to a sole trader. We're thinking of a situation here where we have two or more owners. Now, those two or more owners you could think of as two sole traders. So they've got together and set up a business together and therefore they will be equally liable for the losses. So your losses personally will be limited to half of what the business makes. So you're equally liable for the losses that that business makes, if it makes losses. So the pros and cons, well, similar to a sole trader, 
in that you're able to take responsibility. But more than that, you'll have some more resources because you have a second partner within the business or perhaps other partners as well. It could be more than two within that. So you'll have more resources to call upon within that business. Also remember, people combine well. Some people, some partners within that business may have different strengths to your strengths. You can combine those and ensure that the business is stronger for it. So the key aspect of a partnership is that you work together. Now the downside is that you're still taking a lot of risk. There's still unlimited liability for the partners combined. So if the business makes losses, all of those losses need to be covered. They'll be covered equally by the partners, but again, if they don't have the liquid cash to pay off those losses, they could well be taken to court and could well lose their own assets. So it is risky. It's still a risky way to do business because you will be liable for the losses should the business go badly. So what can we do to limit that liability? Well, rather than a partnership or a sole trader, we could set up a limited company. And that's where the name limited company comes from because you're limiting the losses that can be made on that company. So a limited company means that it's a business that's owned by shareholders. So say, for example, you had two people who wanted to set up a business 50-50. They can either set up a partnership and trade as a partnership, but they'd be liable to all of the losses of that partnership. Or they could set up a limited company and each take 50% of the shares. The most that they could lose, therefore, would be the amount that they had invested in the shares. If the business makes losses, it's seen as a separate legal entity. So it's not actually seen as being those two shareholders. It's a separate legal entity. And so the losses are limited to the amount of the shares. So you can only lose the amount that you've invested in a limited company. You can't lose any more. And managers run the business. Now in small limited companies, the managers will often be the shareholders. In large limited companies, so public companies for example, the shareholders will own the shares and will appoint managers to run the business. They will be the directors. So often in small businesses, the directors are the shareholders. In larger businesses, that's often separated between the shareholders who own the business and the managers or directors that run the business. So what are the pros and cons to having a limited company? Well, on the plus side, there is that limited liability. If the business makes losses, well then you as the owner won't have to make good those losses. It's also tax efficient. So there's a lot of tax benefits to having a limited company. Because if you have a partnership, you'll be taking that income as personal income. So it will be taxed as that. If you have a, a limited company, well you'll take the income from the limited company in the form of a dividend and dividends are often taxed at a lower rate. So it's more tax efficient to set up a limited company. On the downside, well, there's a lot of administration to a limited company. For example, each year, uh, information and accounts have to be lodged at company's house. There has to be an annual return form. So there's a lot of administration that needs to be carried out for a limited company. So that needs to be done. Also, it's inflexible. So once you've set up a limited company, if there are shareholders who aren't the actual people who run the business, well, they can perhaps stop the people who are running the business from doing what they want to do. Now, that can be a good thing because it can protect their investment, but it can also be a bad thing because it makes the company less flexible, less able to do what it wants to do. So those are our three choices for business entities. You need to know the difference between a sole trader, a partnership and a limited company. And you need to see what the benefits of each are and what the drawbacks are. Broadly speaking, for sole traders and partnerships, the big drawback is that you have liability for any losses that the business makes. 
For a limited company, the benefit is that you limit that liability to the amount that you have invested in the business. So thinking then about limited companies in a little bit more detail, let's just draw those differences out between the limited company and the sole traders and partnerships. Remember that the limited company will be a separate legal entity. So again, this is a list that I would learn because it could be something that the examiner focuses in on to say, what are these differences between a sole trader and a partnership? So the first difference is that a limited company is a separate legal entity. The property within that legal entity belongs to the company. So if the company buys assets, those aren't owned by the managers of the business, they're owned by the company itself. So for example, if the business made losses and it couldn't make good those losses, that property would be sold and the proceeds goes to the creditors. It wouldn't be owned by the managers of the business. There's transferable shares. Well, we know that because the stock exchange exists for us to transfer those shares, to buy and sell shares in limited companies. So you can transfer the ownership quite easily. And there's no maximum amount of shares for limited companies. They can keep issuing new shares, uh, although that will dilute old shares, but they can still do it. There's no maximum amount of shares that they can issue. And we have floating security that companies potentially could have. What does that mean? That means that if that company wants to raise debt, so if it wants to take on debt, it can secure that debt against its assets. So it can have what's called floating security against the general assets of the company. That means that if the business went into liquidation, the, the debt holders, those people who had lent money to the company, would have security over the assets of that company. Those assets would be sold off and the debt holders paid back. So limited companies are separate legal entities. The property within them belongs to the company, not the people who own it. They have transferable shares so you can change the ownership. There's no maximum amount of shares and there's floating security over the assets of the business so that you can secure debt to those who provide it to give them some security to make them feel better about giving that debt. So we're going to talk a lot about users in this course because we're going to talk about how a limited company uh, prepares and presents financial statements, that is their accounts. And those will be provided for users. So a lot of what we'll be talking about is providing information to users. So the users that we're talking about are the users of the information that we provide from the company. And we're really thinking here about a large PLC, which is perhaps traded on the stock exchange. Who are the users that will use the information that comes out of that business? Well, of course, it will be the investors, first of all, those people who have bought the shares. They will want to see how the business has performed and whether they should keep that investment or perhaps sell it on. So the first users and the first people that will be interested in the financial statements of a company will be the investors. But there will be others. And these are sometimes referred to as stakeholders, although we are going to think of them as users of the financial information that we are going to learn to produce. So we're thinking about the income statement, statement of financial position or balance sheet. So other people that will be interested in that will be employees because they'll want to see if they still have a job, if the business is doing well. Managers for the same reasons. Are they going to get paid their bonus that they expect this year? Or perhaps should they be moving on from the company? Lenders, we just talked about them when we talked about floating security. Those people who have lent money to the business. Well, they'll be interested to see if the business is doing well, because if it's not, well, then they might not get paid back. So they will be interested in the information coming out of the business. Customers, well, they perhaps are looking for an after sales service. So therefore, they will be interested 
in that information that's coming out of the business. And of course, suppliers, because if they're supplying the business, they want to get paid. They want to make sure that the money that they're owed is able to be paid back. So they'll be interested in the information coming out of the business. And lastly, the government. Well, the government wants to get paid its taxes. It wants to make sure that all VAT is paid, that all PAYE is paid, that all due taxes are going to come from that limited company. So when we're looking at preparing financial information, the accounts of the business, these are the people that will be interested. And a lot of what we're going to be thinking about is for the benefit of the users. How can we provide usable, understandable, accurate information for those users? And that is the basis of all accountancy. How can we provide that information to these users? So what sort of information will we be looking at? Well, we'll be looking at accounting information. And you will need to know the difference between the two different types of accounting information that's provided. The first type of information is management accounting. Management accounting is really for the internal managers within the business. It's not going to be given to those users. It's not going to be published. It's not going to be given to the stock exchange. It's not going to be put out there for public consumption. This is information for the people within the business to run that business well. It's often said that management accounting looks forward, whereas financial accounting, which we'll talk about in a second, looks backward. So management information is trying to give you a accounting information that you can use to make decisions. So it's usually in real time, so it's done very quickly after the events have happened. And there's no standards for this. It depends on the business itself. What will work for one type of business might not work for another. So the type of information produced through management accounting depends on the business. It depends what information they need to push that business forward. So there's no standards for it. It simply depends on the type of business. So management accountancy information is internal information. There's no standards for it. It depends on what the business wants. So it could be anything. They could say, right, we need analysis of our sales compared to uh, whatever else within the business. And you would go and do that. Whereas financial accountancy is for the external users that we just talked about, for the investors the managers, the lenders, the customers, the suppliers. So this is published. Financial accountancy information is published. So that means it needs to be based on standards. Why does it need to be based on standards? Well, for comparability. We need to be able to compare what one business has done to another business. We need to be able to compare what the same business has done year on year on year. So financial information is really historic information. That's what the business has done in the recent past. So we're producing that information for external users for them to base their decisions on. So investors can decide whether they stay invested, for example. So that's the big difference between management and financial information. Management accountancy is looking within the business and there's no standards, it's just whatever they need to run it. Financial accountancy is for the external users, it's based on standards which we'll look at later on, and that's all about comparability. So we need a system that's going to provide the information within the business, and it's usually computerized to do that. So they'll set it up so that it produces the management accountancy information we require, and is compatible with the financial accountancy information so that it can be produced for those users. So that's what we're going to concentrate in this course on, the financial information that's provided, the standards, those um, a, accounts that are produced for external users. Management accountancy will be looked at in a different module. So where does the regulation come from for those standards that I mentioned? 
Well, there's the IFRS Foundation, which is the International Financial Reporting Standards. This is the one that we're going to look at. What do they do? Well, they support the IASB, which we'll mention in a moment. There's 22 trustees within the IFRS Foundation, and it's really concerned with governance, with making sure that the information is provided from companies correctly and that the business is uh, run correctly. The objectives of the IFRS Foundation are to develop global standards. Again, remember we said that financial information needs to be comparable. We need to be able to compare it to last year. We need to be able to compare it to other companies. So they develop the global standards that provides that information to users. And that helps investors make decisions. So that IASB that we mentioned is the International Accounting Standards Board. So what does it do? Well, whereas the IFRS Foundation was concerned with governance, this is where we actually issue the accounting standards. So the standards that we will look at later that give us the rules on which we prepare the financial accounts are issued by the IASB. So uh, this issues the IFRS, there's 15 members of it, and the objectives are the same as the foundation, to develop those global standards to provide information to users. Remember, we're back to those users, and I said we'll talk about that a lot through the course. Now, what about national bodies? Because often there'll be a set of accounting standards that are used within a certain area, like UK GAP, for example. Well, they will work with the IASB. They need the cooperation of the national standard setters, and it may be that they choose to implement IFRS. A lot of national bodies simply implement IFRS now, and there is a movement globally for national standard setters to start to implement IFRS. So often the national standards will be very similar or identical. So getting that convergence between the national standards and IFRS is a big issue at this point in time. We're pushing towards it. We're trying to get a global set of standards for comparability so that everybody is preparing on the same basis. So when we look at those different types of regulation, there are various ways to do it. So IFRS is principles based. So the example of principles based regulation is IFRS that we're going to look at. And it's based on a conceptual framework that we'll talk about later on in this course. And that means there's not defined rules. We don't have a rule for absolutely everything. What we have is a framework of principles and we work within that framework. As opposed to rules based, for example, US GAAP, so the American accounting rules. Well, these are a set of clearly defined rules. The problem with that is that every time you come up with a rule, someone comes up with a way to get around it. Whereas if you have a principle, well, you can't really get around it because you wouldn't be acting uh, faithfully to that principle. So principles-based um, regulation tends to restrict how people can usurp it, how they get around it. Whereas if you have rules, well, someone will come up with a way to get around those rules. And then you have to come up with another rule. So it tends to be that there's a lot of clear set rules uh, by the end. Why regulate at all? Well, what we want to do is provide that comparable information that we've already mentioned in this session. It needs to be useful to the users. So we need to stipulate what information is required. If we just allowed each company to do what they liked, well then we wouldn't be able to compare. So we have to say, no, each company needs to prepare this information they need to prepare it in this way so that investors can make decisions between different businesses. Also, we need to regulate the behavior of these businesses. It's been found in the past that if you don't strictly regulate, well then you will find that managers mismanage, that people take advantage of the lack of regulation for their own benefit. 
and that that then is to the detriment of shareholders who ultimately are taking the risk. So management, for example, conduct fraud for their own benefit. That damages the business and the shareholders or owners of the business lose out because the business collapses. So we need to try to prevent that. We need to regulate the behaviour. So that was our session on an introduction to accounting. Make sure that you know the different types of business entity. Make sure you understand the differences, the pros and cons. Then particularly around limited companies, why we produce financial information, who it's for, those users. The difference between financial and management information. And then know those regulatory bodies, the IFRS Foundation, the IASB, and the difference between principles-based regulation and rules-based regulation. Once you've done this, try the test your knowledge questions at the end of this chapter. So chapter one in your workbook has test your knowledge questions at the end. We're only at the very start of our course here, so we haven't really got to the point where we can do detailed illustrations. So have a look at those questions, have a go at them, see how you do. If you get more than two or three of them wrong, you need to go back and review this lecture and make sure you understand those aspects where you slipped up.